So it's a uh, it's a pleasure to give uh, a talk here. Um, so thanks to the organizers of this uh, conference, um, and uh, apologies uh, to anyone who has heard some version of this talk. Uh, please feel free to not hear this talk by leaving or or paying attention to something else. So uh, this is the title of my talk, Stability of the Kerr Cauchy Horizon and the Strong Cosmic Censorship Conjecture in General Relativity. Let me uh, immediately give you an outline of this talk. So first and foremost, this talk is really about the inside of black holes and a um, big conjecture in general relativity, which in some sense is motivated by the behavior of black hole interiors. So uh, a few weeks ago, I gave a, a talk about aspects of the stability problem inside and, and outside of black holes. And I ended up talking mostly about the outside, so uh, this talk will be only about the inside. So uh, this talk is, uh, is about the black hole interiors. Uh, so this problem for many years was understood from the point of view of sort of linearized and, and nonlinear toy models, which I'll run through. And uh, the main uh, result of this talk, which will be, it's a joint theorem with, with Jonathan Luke from Cambridge. Um, in some sense, sort of resolves. Uh, he's still there. <laughs> still there. On paper. Um, uh, re resolves um, this um, this issue in some sense. Okay. So I'll I'll um, so I say resolves this issue. There's still something very important left to be done, and that's uh, that will be the end of the talk. So this is uh, my outline. Uh, so off we go into the interior of black holes uh, and this strong cosmic censorship conjecture. So, uh, so the story, if you want, starts with the Schwarzschild family of solutions, as any good story about general relativity should. So um, Cecile, in her talk this morning, already introduced the initial value problem for the Einstein vacuum equations, the equations Ricci curvature of a Lorentzian form manifold equals zero. In some sense, the first non-trivial solution of these equations to be discovered is the celebrated Schwarzschild thumb. This was discovered actually already in, in December 1915 and published in, in January 1916. So we are really celebrating the centennial of the of the publishing of this of this solution. So what I want you to uh, know about this solution. Uh, one, one could certainly give a whole lecture just about the solution, but what I want you to know for the purpose of this talk is the following uh, facts, all of which are written on this slide and which I'm going to go through. So first of all, you, you can think of this as a solution of the initial value problem, and it arises from sort of good initial data, in particular asymptotically flat, complete initial data. The only funny thing about the initial data is that it has two asymptotically flat ends, and I've depicted sort of the initial data uh, in this sort of schematic description, okay, where actually every point here is a sphere, okay, so this topologically is S2 cross R, and this and this are the two asymptotically flat ends. Okay, so it's a solution that arises from regular initial data. Nothing, nothing is wrong with initial data. On the other hand, the solution itself is geodesically incomplete. Okay, so in some sense, this is the first example of why global existence does not hold for the for the Einstein vacuum equation. You already see it in, in this solution. So the solution is geodesically incomplete, okay? but at the same time, observers at infinity, they live forever. So how is that possible, and what does that mean? So you should think that observers at infinity is just a sort of uh, a way of saying, you know, uh, parameterizing the limit t plus r goes to infinity. Okay? So that limit's very important in general relativity because that's where gravitational radiation is detected, as we found out uh, last February. So, um, 
So that sort of limit, you can think of it as an ideal boundary of space-time called future null infinity. This is depicted here. It has two connected components because, because as I said, the data has two asymptotically flat ends. And those sort of that boundary at infinity is itself complete. Okay? So if you normalize time at null infinity, then the time goes on forever in both the forward and past directions. Okay? At the same time, if you ask yourself, what is the past of null infinity? What are the points in space-time that can communicate with these faraway observers? Then that past has a non-empty complement. And that's what, if you learn to sort of read these space-time diagrams, that's what's depicted here. So in general, uh, when the past of future null infinity has a non-empty complement, we call that region the black hole region of space-time. So Schwarzschild is also the most basic example of a solution of the Einstein vacuum equations with a black hole region. Okay. So it, it so happens that any observer, so any time-like geodesic that enters the black hole only lives for finite time, but all the observers who refuse to enter the black hole, they live forever. Okay. So somehow you have geodesic incompleteness, but the incompleteness is hidden inside of this black hole region. Okay. So that's sort of the second thing that I want you to take away from, from Schwarzschild. But then there's a, a third thing, which in some sense is the most interesting from the point of view of this talk. What, what happens to observers who enter this black hole? Well, I already told you that they only live for finite time, but why is that? So it turns out that uh, you can picture them as asymptoting to a singular boundary of space-time at which the curvature blows up. Okay? And this boundary is uh, r equals zero. Okay? And uh, there's something more you can say about this singular boundary than the fact that the curvature blows up. So first of all, it is space-like. So again, that is manifest from this depiction if you know about space-time diagrams. But uh, one can also relate it to the talk of Zag uh, yesterday. Uh, so in the language of, the, of his talk, uh, that's the statement that every point in the boundary uh, is non-characteristic. Okay? So that's really sort of equivalently to the statement. So this is a space-like singular boundary. And moreover, not only does the curvature blow up, which we sort of we know from um, sort of PD theory that curvature blowing up per se is not necessarily fatal, uh, the, the metric itself blows up in some sense. And well, the correct way to say that uh, is that the metric is inextendable beyond r equals zero even as a, as a merely continuous Lorentzian metric. Okay. And actually that uh, statement was only recently uh, proven in a nice paper of Jan Spierski. So to summarize, Schwarzschild, it emerges from perfectly fine initial data, but the space-time is not fine. It's geodesically incomplete. Okay. On the other hand, faraway observers, they live forever, and the incompleteness is in a black hole. And if you are so silly as to enter the black hole, uh, then you only live for finite time. And moreover, you will be torn apart by infinite tidal deformations. Uh, and uh, in some sense, being torn apart by infinite tidal deformations, you should think about as being related to the fact that it's the metric itself that breaks down, not just the curvature. So it's a very strong singularity. And moreover, the singularity is space-like. Okay? which means nearby points uh, sort of on the singularity you know, do not communicate with each other. Or again, in the language of Zag, uh, the, the points of the singularity are non-characteristic. Okay? So this is Schwarzschild. Okay. But uh, uh, let me already uh, say a, a big conjecture in general relativity that I'm not going to talk about, uh, but is motivated already by Schwarzschild. And this is the so-called weak cosmic censorship. Um, so when Schwarzschild was first understood geometrically, people thought that all these behaviors were bad and pathological. And there was a hope that uh, all these behaviors at the end of the day uh, were a result of Schwarzschild being very symmetric. And in particular, there was a hope that if you perturbed the initial data leading to Schwarzschild, then you know, space-time would be geodesically complete, you wouldn't have a black hole, etc., etc. And it's important to remember that that, uh, that hope was spectacularly falsified in a very short seminal paper of, of Penrose from 1965 when he proved his celebrated <coughs> incompleteness theorem. 
And a corollary of this theorem is the statement that if you perturb Schwarzschild initial data and solve the Einstein vacuum equations, you're still geodesically incomplete. Okay? So, uh, so when you take a second look at Schwarzschild, then Schwarzschild isn't that bad because at least this incompleteness is hidden in black holes. Okay? So uh, this gives rise to a, a conjecture known as weak cosmic censorship, which says that for generic, and I'll get back to this word generic, asymptotically flat vacuum initial data, you always have a complete null infinity. So you should really think of this as the statement that you know, very far away observers in the radiation zone, they live forever. Okay? So this is really, if you want, the global existence conjecture in general relativity, which is still compatible with Penrose's incompleteness theory. So why generic? Why not for all initial data? Well, actually, the, our only understanding of this conjecture comes from a toy model studied back in the 90s by Dimitri Christodoulou, uh, namely the spherically symmetric Einstein scalar field system. And he proved the analog of this conjecture restricted to spherical symmetry, but he also at the same time uh, gave uh, examples of, of space times for which, uh, complete for which future null infinity is not complete. Okay? So such space times are said to possess a naked singularity. Okay? So he proved that they were non-generic, but uh, he also proved that they existed. So uh, this is something to keep in mind. I'm, I'm actually uh, giving you this conjecture uh, also so that the, the name of the main conjecture I'm going to talk about makes more sense. But anyway, that's, um, it's a nice conjecture that we should all know if we want to study relativity. All right, uh, back to Schwarzschild. Well, Schwarzschild, it turns out, it does not come alone as a solution of the Einstein vacuum equations, it's embedded in a larger two-parameter family of solutions uh, which are much more subtle and were discovered much, much later and are known as the Kerr family of solutions. So if I could spend a whole lecture on Schwarzschild, I could spend maybe a, a week of lectures on the geometry of the Kerr solution. Uh, I don't have time for that and you certainly don't want to listen to that. So let me uh, just tell you what we need to know about the Kerr uh, solution for the purpose of this talk. So first of all, just like Schwarzschild, these uh, Kerr solutions are again geodesically incomplete, okay? And they again have a non-trivial black hole region. In fact, qualitatively speaking, the initial data looks much like Schwarzschild. It's sitting on the same topology. And it's again asymptotically flat with two ends. And again, there's a future null infinity with two connected components. Again, future null infinity is complete, so Far away observers live forever. This is not a counterexample to weak cosmic censorship. All right, but if you look at the past of future null infinity, okay, that's this region here and this region here, that has a non-trivial complement in the space-time, the black hole region. Okay. So all that is just like in Schwarzschild. But now there's a difference uh, when we look at the interior of the black hole region. Uh, turns out that the, the interior of the black hole region is not bounded by a sort of a space-like singular boundary where all observers approaching are, are, are torn apart. Uh, on the contrary, the, the interior of the black hole region, or at least the interior of the region, which is uniquely determined by initial data, is bounded by a null boundary on which the solution is everywhere regular. Um, so moreover, that means that you can smoothly extend the solution beyond this boundary, okay, and we call the boundary a Cauchy horizon. Okay. So what's, what's happening here, okay? uh, you see, we can extend the solution beyond this boundary, but these extensions will no longer be globally hyperbolic. That's to say, they are no longer uniquely determined by initial data. So here's a situation that does not happen in the model problems that we heard about uh, in the talk of Zag. Here you see that the, the boundary of the Cauchy development can be everywhere characteristic. And moreover, nowhere on the boundary does anything blow up. Okay, so this is something very, very strange from the point of view of the, the model problem that we saw about. And it's because you don't necessarily have a, a quote, a first singular time. Right? And this really has to do with um, well, the sort of fact that if you want, time is relative in general. So, um, so you might say this is much better than Schwarzschild. It's much better to not blow up than to blow up, right? 
And it's certainly much better from the point of view of this observer here. This observer sails past this Cauchy horizon, presumably into some extension. We just don't know what the extension is. But from the point of view of uh, the theory, this uh, situation is actually thought to be worse. The reason that it's worse is that here we see a breakdown of determinism, of the ability of the theory to predict the future. And there's nothing that manifestly says that you have left the validity of the theory. No, there is no blow up. Nowhere. So that's very, very strange. So in some sense, uh, the situation in Schwarzschild, where everyone is accounted for, observers who don't enter the black hole live forever, observers who enter the black hole are torn apart, this sort of is more satisfying from the point of view of uh, determinism. I have a question. Is there any sense where there an M tilde can be taken to be maximal? Do you have a choice of M tildes? Or? Well, you can try to sort of take a bigger and bigger M tilde, but that's certainly not a unique object. Right? I mean, you can try to sort of look at extensions which are themselves inextendable in various senses. So, that, so there is in that notion a, a maximal, but, but not a maximal. I don't know. <laughs> right. Um, so, so in fact, this uh, behavior is deemed to be so pathological and so sort of worrisome that uh, one stance to take is that maybe this is all a fluke. Maybe it will go away upon perturbation of initial data. And this uh, happy thought uh, um, motivated uh, Roger Penrose back in 1972 to conjecture the following. For generic asymptotically flat initial data for the Einstein vacuum equations, then uh, the solution space-time, which is determined by initial data, so if you want the analog of the darker shaded region here, okay, sh cannot be extended as a suitably regular Lorentzian manifold. So, of course, here it's clear why you have to say generic. The Kerr solution itself does not satisfy the predicate of this conjecture. Okay, so this, this says that, in particular, Kerr inside the black hole has to be unstable. Okay? But more generally, sort of any generic initial data okay, should have the property that the Cauchy development is in extent. So, as is written here, you can really think of this conjecture as the statement of global uniqueness in general relativity, just like the weak cosmic censorship uh, is the statement of global existence. Okay? So, in fact, those would be much better words for, or names for these two conjectures because there's nothing about this conjecture which is stronger than this conjecture. They're really two different statements. So the only, in some sense... censorship sounds better than existence. In of course, needless to say. Uh, so the only sense that this, this is sort of stronger than uh, this is that the, the Kerr family is a sort of uh, counterexample for strong cosmic censorship, or, you know, were it generic, whereas it is not for weak cosmic censorship. Okay? But the, uh, in general, these statements are not, one is not weaker or stronger than the other. Okay. So this is, this is the, the, the conjecture. So, so far I've I've only motivated this conjecture by philosophy. And actually, I just came back from a conference on philosophy of science. And believe me, after attending that conference, you don't want your conjectures to be motivated by philosophy. Uh, so it turns out that there's, a <laughs> there's an honest reason to hope that this conjecture might be true. And this was also uh, first um, put forward by Penrose. And it's uh, the so-called blue shift instability. So uh, what he observed is the following. So uh, imagine you have two observers, observer A and observer B, where observer A enters the black hole and observer B does not. Okay. So these two observers are, are depicted here. And imagine that observer B sends a light signal to observer A at a finite rate as measured by observer B. So every two seconds, whatever. Now remember, observer B not entering the black hole means that observer B lives forever. Okay? So observer B sends infinitely many signals over the sort of course of his or her life to observer A. On the other hand, observer A reaches the Cauchy horizon in finite time. Okay? So all these infinite signals, observer A sort of receives them in finite time. 
which means that the, the frequency okay, of the signal as the observer A's time goes to this time value goes to infinity. So it's infinitely shifted to the blue in the electromagnetic spectrum. So uh, this sort of uh, geometric optics type instability, uh, Penrose argued, would cause solutions of the wave equation on this background to blow up in some way at the Cauchy horizon. And then you can think of this wave equation, this is just the covariant wave equation, scalar wave equation on this background, as some naive model for the linearized Einstein equations. Okay? So maybe that means that, at least in linear theory, we see that sort of you have some sort of blob of something associated to this Cauchy horizon. Okay? So this was actually his heuristic argument, and this, in some sense, this was the heuristics behind making this much more ambitious conjecture. But actually, uh, people took this argument one step further. So of course, uh, if you look at a linear wave equation on a globally hyperbolic space-time, then you can only blow up at the boundary. You cannot blow up in inside the space-time, just as a matter of principle. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if, if you now take into account the full nonlinear theory, you might think that uh, once sort of uh, linear perturbations start getting big, then nonlinearities will take over, and that would cause the space-time to blow up before sort of you know, the, the boundary of the original space-time that you were perturbing. Okay? That's to say you might expect that you would develop a space-like singularity before being able to reach this sort of null boundary. Okay? Or again, to use the terminology of, of Zag, uh, that might make you expect that sort of the boundary should now be um, non-characteristic okay. and singular. So, um, so somehow the working hypothesis that most people sort of subscribe to was that the generic uh, dynamic solutions of the Einstein equation would look causally, the causal picture would look like Schwarzschild. Okay. This is sort of funny because of course the Schwarzschild family is non-generic within the Kerr family, but the claim was that if you looked more generally within sort of, the, sort of all dynamic solutions, then the generic case would be would look like Schwarzschild. And this is something that has been discussed in, in the physics literature uh, sort of for a very long time, and many people have, have, have written about this. So let me isolate this uh, statement as what I'll call very strong cosmic censorship. And again, uh, because unfortunately, Strong cosmic censorship is not called um, the global uniqueness conjecture. I cannot call this the strong global uniqueness. I have to call it very strong cosmic censorship. Okay. So very cos strong cosmic censorship says essentially that, that uh, for generic vacuum asymptotically flat initial data, uh, the part of the solution space-time determined uniquely by initial data cannot be extended to Lorentzian manifold. And now I'll tell you exactly in what way. Okay. Even with a metric assumed only continuous. Okay? Even with a metric assumed only continuous. All right? That's to say, in exactly the same way that Schwarzschild could not be extended. And moreover, I'll throw in for good measure the statement that the singularity can be naturally thought of as space-like. So this boundary is non-characteristic in the terminology of Merlin Zag. Okay. So this is the very strong cosmic censure. And this is in fact the, the sort of formulation that was sort of widely believed. Can one always make this comment that whenever you have a space like singularity, you have the metric will have to... No. 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 In fact, uh, sort of as the paper of Zbierski shows, it's a very uh, tricky business to show that a metric cannot be extended even just as a continuous metric exactly because there are no you know, pointwise invariants that capture that. So it's, it's tricky. And the, in fact, uh, it, it was Birsky who first proved that Minkowski space is not extendable as a metric with a, as a Lorentzian metric with continuous metric. So even that was not known. All right, so let me give you a little bit of the prehistory of the problem, even though some of the prehistory uh, is very, very recent as, um, as these things go. So... Um, so actually, uh, let me start with Penrose's heuristic argument. Uh, it's, it's actually very, very easy to show uh, that... So I'll draw, for good measure, a uh, 
So this is this picture of the Kerr metric. This is the event horizon boundary of the black hole region. This is the black hole region. This is null infinity, and this is the Cauchy horizon. It's very uh, easy to show that if you have initial data, you can find initial data for the wave equation in the energy class, so, so with finite energy, such that the uh, solution here, okay, so if I look at the hypersurface transverse to the Cauchy horizon, will have infinite energy here. Okay? And you can do this exactly by the sort of geometric optics argument, in fact, uh, there's a proof of that by Zbierski using Gaussian beams. So that's very easy. On the other hand, of course, we all know even from the stability of Minkowski space that um, when we think of perturbing Kerr, we're not perturbing in the energy class, we're perturbing sort of in some sort of weighted energy class. And now you might somehow worry that the, the decay that that generates will compete with this uh, sort of um, blue shift instability effect. So actually, um, you can show that the, the blue shift instability wins, and this is a theorem both on subextremal Reister Nordstrom, which is a poor man's sort of version of Kerr, but also on, on Kerr itself in the, in the full subextremal uh, range. And uh, essentially, the statement is that generic solutions of the wave equation, which are localized, in fact, they can, they can decay very, very fast to a space like infinity. Uh, will fail to have a finite local energy everywhere on the Cauchy horizon. Okay. So indeed, in linear theory, there is, yeah, there is some truth to what Penrose was saying. Okay. So, um, so anyway, there, there are all sorts of other comments that one can make. Uh, uh, so in particular, you can actually relate specifically a lower bound for the sort of tail of a solution of the wave equation on the event horizon to uh, the blow up of the local L2 norm of, of its gradient uh, at the Cauchy horizon. Okay? So there's something, in fact, you can, you can say like that, which is very important, for particular for, <laughs> for the future. All right, so this is, the, this is the, the blue shift effect. So it's there. But at the same time, um, it turns out that this blow up is weak. So I told you that the uh, local energy of the solution, the generic solution of the wave equation, is infinite. But it turns out that the amplitude of the solution, C itself, remains uniformly bounded um, in the black hole interior, all the way up to the Cauchy horizon. And in fact, not only is it uniformly bounded, uh, it turns out that you can continuously extend it to the, to the Cauchy horizon and thus to some sort of larger region. So this was a theorem of uh, Anne Franzen. Um, and while well, there are also various sort of extensions and generalizations, maybe uh, let me not talk about them here. Uh, so let me just say a few words about the proof of this, just to give you an idea. Uh, so just to recall, this is all consistent, right? The generic solution will blow up in sort of H1 log, if you want, but will be sort of remain continuous, okay? Um, so to prove this theorem, you can make use of results that tell you everything you want to know about solutions of the wave equation on the exterior of a, of a sub-extremal Kerr black hole. In particular, you know that, let's say, tangential derivatives of C to the event horizon, okay, they decay like V to some negative power. And the only thing I really need to know about that power is that it's bigger than 1. That's the only thing I need to know. Okay. So this was uh, sort of for sub-extremal uh, Kerr was a theorem of, of mine with Rodnianski and Schleppentoff Rothman. So starting with this information and using so-called redshift vector field, uh, this type of decay for uh, C uh, propagates, it's very easy to show, into a little region inside the black hole interior. Okay? So, uh, so that's easy to show. And then it turns out that you can do uh, a nice uh, estimate in the rest of the region using a vector field, 
it's not so difficult to write down. It's uh, of this form. And the only thing that's funny is the coordinates. So for those of you who know about uh, sort of standard coordinates in black hole theory, these are Eddington-Finkelstein-like coordinates in the black hole interior. Okay? So uh, this is um, v equals infinity, and this is u equals minus infinity. Okay? So it turns out that uh, you can apply, and p, again, will be greater than 1. You can apply this as a vector field multiplier to the wave equation. And uh, this assumption allows you to bound the initial energy terms. Okay? So then if you think about it, uh, bounding, so what does that mean on a, on a hypersurface like that? You're bounding something like this dv. Okay? So if you think about this, then after further commutations, this type of a bound, because p is bigger than 1, allows you to show that the c remains bounded. In fact, uh, extends continuously. So this is what she did. Um, okay. So uh, so that's um, Anna's theorem. So now let me make some comments. So of course, if you naively extrapolate now this linear behavior um, for the linear wave equation to the Einstein vacuum equations, then what would you do? You would identify Ψ with the metric and derivatives of Ψ with the Christoffel symbols. So I just told you that Ψ doesn't break down, in fact it extends continuously, but derivatives of Ψ, they, they blow up here, in fact they're not even locally L2. Okay? So that would suggest, if you could just extrapolate, that when you perturb Kerr initial data, okay, the Cauchy horizon survives as a null bifurcate hypersurface, and the metric remains close to the Kerr metric, just in L infinity. All right. Uh, on the other hand, uh, higher derivatives of the metric should be blowing up. So that would mean that the boundary is something that one could call a, a weak null singularity, even though for various reasons the name is not so great. Uh, th this blow up is such that you're no longer even a weak solution of the Einstein equations, okay? but the blow up is much weaker than in Schwarzschild. Okay? So hence the name. Um, so anyway, there was some evidence for this actually, which came out of a sort of uh, analysis of some fully nonlinear spherically symmetric toy models. Again, there's a big literature on that, and I contributed to that uh, many years ago. On the other hand, uh, most people did not believe that this extrapolation uh, was correct. That's to say, uh, in particular, if you believe this original intuition, then in the absence of symmetries, then the nonlinearities of the Einstein equation should just take over once, they, once the perturbations become large enough, and you should get a, a, a space like a singularity before. Okay, so the question is, which, which of these two scenarios hold? If you okay. So let's leave all this linearized and sort of toy models behind and, and go to generic dynamical black hole interiors. So if, if you're a fan of this scenario, and I sort of was, I admit, then the first question you have to ask is, can you even just locally uh, construct um, just a piece of vacuum spacetime which has a null boundary which is singular in, in the way that it would have to be by this extrapolation. Because, you know, there are no explicit solutions of the vacuum equation that sort of uh, exhibited this type of singularity, and this is one of the reasons that many people thought that you, you wouldn't have that. So, uh, so can you even just locally construct this? And this uh, problem was resolved by Jonathan Luke in a remarkable paper of a few years back. And he, he constructed such examples by solving a characteristic initial value problem. So let me sort of draw his theorem. So um, he considered initial data for the Einstein vacuum equations that were posed on, uh, if you want, on, on what would be the future of a sphere. Okay, so this is a sphere. It's outgoing and ingoing light cone. Okay, so I'm going to draw these two light cones just like this. Okay, so this is the sphere and these are the two light cones. 
Okay. So, um, so how do you prescribe characteristic initial data for the Einstein vacuum equations? Well, actually, there's, in certain senses, it's, it's more easy than space-like initial data because it's more easy to deal with the constraint equations. And it turns out that, essentially, the free data is given by the shear of this cone and this cone, okay, plus some information coming from here. Okay. So the shear is in honor of Christodoulou and Kleinerman, uh, is typically denoted by uh, he hat and he bar hat. This is the shear of this cone. This is the so shear just means the, the traceless part of the second fundamental form. Okay. So that's really the free data. You, you basically get to prescribe that um, arbitrarily. Okay. And then you're going to try to solve the Einstein vacuum equations in a double null gauge. Okay. That's sort of tailored very nicely to this sort of setup. That's to say, you're going to construct locally a spacetime which is foliated by ingoing and outgoing null cones, okay, which are drawn like this. Okay. And in this picture, okay, this is sort of the, these would be those light cones. Okay. And uh, I'm going to sort of, you can think of these light cones as defining two null coordinate systems. Okay. So my, uh, so one sort of coordinate system will be V equals constant and the other will be U equals constant. Okay. So this, I'll make it V equals zero. And this, if you want, is, I don't know, u equals zero. Okay? So these are constant u's and these are constant v's. Okay. So what he says is, okay, I'm going to choose the initial data, okay, to be singular as you go here. Okay? And moreover, to be singular as you go here, all right, in a way that would make the Christoffel symbols fail to be L2. So this is a Christoffel symbol. It's second fundamental form. Okay. So what's your favorite function, which is not in L2, but is in L1? Why should it be in L1? I want the metric to be continuous, and the metric is an integral of this, you should think. So my favorite function is what's written there. Uh, v to the minus 1 uh, log minus V to the minus p for p bigger than one. Okay, so this is this is v equals zero. This is uh, sort of barely in L one. Okay, but it's certainly not in L two. Okay, so this is very singular initial data. Okay. So you might expect that even if you can prove well posedness for the initial value problem, the solution will only exist up to some region like this. And what Jonathan Luke proved is that no, um, the solution exists all the way up to v equals zero, at least if I restrict to small enough sort of time in this direction. That's what he proved. So uh, I can't say much about this proof, but let me just say uh, uh, a few words which are really geared to, 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 to the experts. Um, so when you write the sort of Einstein equations in such a double null coordinate system, you have the metric, you have sort of Christoffel symbols, and you have curvature. Okay. Where these are written with respect to a sort of a, a null frame, which is tailor-made to, 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 to these sort of double null coordinates. So anyway, I mean, there are some notation for the metric components. And again, this is really for people who know about this. Otherwise, you can read a book for hopefully not more than two minutes. So these are examples of Christoffel symbols. And then uh, we also have curvature. Okay. And what, um, what uh, Jonathan did is the following. So first of all, it turns out that uh, if you look at the expected behavior of some of the curvature components, it's just too singular to do anything. So a very remarkable thing happens. You can renormalize the system. You can drop these, and you can redefine rho and sigma 
and you can write again a closed system of equations. So the re definition of rho and sigma, essentially you replace rho with the, the Gauss curvature of the spheres of intersection, and you replace sigma with something that looks like this. So this is called sigma hat, or ch sigma check rather. This actually has a geometric interpretation that I won't get away to. Um, and now sort of these um, quantities are less singular. So this is actually something that uh, arises from some earlier work of uh, Rodnyansky and Luke. So what, what they actually showed is that uh, if he hat is assumed to be uh, somehow, if he had this assumed to be L infinity, okay, then you can, um, you know, y you can still sort of close estimates for this renormalized system, okay, and prove a local well pose of this, okay. But here, uh, he had is much uh, less regular. So it turns out that this is already appearing in Christodoulou, right? I mean, uh, the fact that you, you you are dealing with something which is singular. Yeah, yes, but it's it's a yes in philosophically yes, certainly philosophically yes. Okay, so what what uh, what he showed here is that you can prove weighted estimates, okay, for these quantities where you introduce a weight which sort of uh, cancels this singular behavior, and you can close estimates uh, for these quantities. Now, of course, secretly what's going on is there's, there's a very subtle null condition for these renormalized quantities that uh, allows you to sort of control things. Okay. So I don't really have uh, time to say more uh, about this, but just sort of remember what's on the board and remember this funny expression here. So the other thing that maybe is, is good to sort of emphasize, you can think of this as a low regularity well positive theorem. And when you think of it as such, you see that it's much lower than the, the sort of best general local well positive theorem, which is the L2 curvature theorem of Sergio and uh, Jeremy and uh, Rodnyansky. Okay? And the reason is that here the, <laughs> you know, the Christoffel symbols are not in L2. Okay? So it's really much, much more singular. On the other hand, that singularity is compensated by extra regularity in other quantities. Okay? And if you want, this sort of null condition plus this renormalization is what tells you that okay, this is consistent and propagated. Okay. So this is what Jonathan did in his really remarkable paper. And in fact, it, it gets even better because he showed that, well, not only can you sort of have one of these singular fronts, but you can choose the data so that here, also, let me re, re, yeah, change u equals zero to here. Uh, so this is u equals minus, it doesn't matter. Okay. You also have a singular front here, and you can arrange the data so that you can solve in this whole neighborhood here, in all of it. Okay. So you have existence up, up to, if you want, this sort of bifurcate uh, sphere. Okay. So this creates a little piece of space-time, okay, such that the, the space-time has a weak null singularity here and here. Okay. All right. Moreover, you can you can extend continuously sort of the metric beyond. Okay. So that was that was Jonathan's work. So this is really great. This tells you that there's nothing wrong in principle with having weak null singularities, but of course it does not tell you that weak null singularities occur inside black hole interiors. Okay? It just says that in, in principle that it's not inconsistent. But uh, um, so how does one show that um, weak null singularities occur in, in black hole interior? Well, uh, you have to start with some information. So of course in um, linear theory, when I talked about Anna's uh, proof that solutions of the linear wave equation uh, remain bounded, she could start with the fact that we know that solutions of the linear wave equation, they decay polynomially uh, sort of to zero at a sufficiently fast rate. Now the analog of that statement in nonlinear theory is not yet known. It's 
none other than the conjecture that the exterior region of the Kerr black hole is stable. So, um, so, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to assume this conjecture to be true. Okay? So then, uh, the theorem, uh, which is forthcoming, and hopefully very soon, it will be out, um, which is joined with Jonathan Luke, says the following, if indeed the Kerr solution is stable in its exterior, then the Penrose diagram of Kerr is globally stable. And moreover, uh, the sort of solution is extendable beyond, okay, as a continuous metric, just like Kerr is. So in particular, uh, if the exterior region of Kerr is stable, then a very strong cosmic censorship is false. So let me just say very, very briefly, just to say something about this proof. Um, maybe I'll say it here because it sort of goes better with it with what's written here. Um, so what, what does it mean to assume the stability of Kerr? It means that you can start the problem here. That's to say you can start the problem, if you want, from a bifurcate null hypersurface that would be the event horizon of these dynamic space times. And the assumption which is given to you by the stability of Kerr essentially says that the shear of this cone, and also this one, but let me always talk about sort of this side, okay, decays at a suitably uh, fast polynomial rate. So something like this. Okay. So in fact, all we need is that we have initial data. So this initial data is complete. So V goes to infinity. Okay. So all we need is that we have initial data, which is approaching Kerr, at this rate, okay? And these rates are not thought to be sharp, okay? So this is sort of a weaker, you need a sort of a weaker version of what's what going to be true. What is P has to be bigger than one, that's all, so just one. So, um, so now, uh, again, it's, it's very easy to show that things propagate uh, to a sort of the analog of an R equals constant space-like hypersurface a little bit in the black hole. That's very easy. You do it with sort of redshift techniques. And then what you want to do is you want to apply the analog of the, this vector field to all these uh, components. Okay? Um, so the remarkable thing that happens is the following. So you can apply these vector fields to all components of this renormalized system. And for a large time, as you're approaching the Cauchy horizon, you think you're essentially showing a global existence result with a null condition. But actually, this coordinate v is related to sort of local coordinates at the Cauchy horizon. Let me call local coordinate capital V by the transformation e to the minus alpha v equals, let's say, minus capital V, where alpha is some positive constant. So what's remarkable about all this is that if you do this transformation, uh, <laughs> this behavior uh, sort of gets transformed into this behavior with capital V. And so the, these weights mesh with exactly with sort of the weights that come in this theorem. And it happens without even thinking about it. Is it P the same? I mean, yeah. yeah. P is the same. Yeah. So here, the bigger the P, the faster you decay. Yeah. This P makes it less singular, remember. This P makes this less singular. Unless I, yeah. Because remember, th this is blowing up the log. So, um, so let me just make a comment. This theorem is not telling you that the boundary is singular. And in fact, the boundary will not be singular for all initial data, particular Kerr data. It's not singular. Okay? This is just telling you that if it's singular, it's not too singular. Okay? On the other hand, since we expect that it will be singular generically, the estimates have to be compatible with exactly the singularity that supposedly will happen. 
All right, let me just give a few more comments. I will not take more than two minutes. So, <laughs> one minute, okay. So let me first give an aside. Uh, there's a cousin of this problem, a sort of younger cousin. Uh, you can add a positive cosmological constant to the Einstein equation. And, um, well, it's hard to find this solution in a textbook, but there is a solution called the kerr desider solution, which would be the analog of the Kerr solution in if sort of you add this cosmological constant to the Einstein equation. Now, unfortunately, sort of in the regime where we have black holes, the cosmological constant is zero. So these don't really occur in physics as we understand it. But they're a very nice mathematical model. And in particular, uh, very, very recently, a week ago, uh, Peter Hintz and Andras Vasi showed the stability of a certain region of this spacetime, namely the region uh, bounded between the event and cosmological horizons. Okay. So actually, um, sort of, uh, if you look at this uh, Kurt de Sitter spacetime in the region beyond the event horizon, then uh, essentially adding lambda is not so important. And our theorem actually applies. So in particular, uh, using this and our theorem, you can show that the analog of strong cosmic censorship, uh, if you add this cosmological constant, is unconditionally false. Okay. So. Um, so, and we will, we will write something uh, about this. Uh, actually, this uh, space time has another interesting region, namely a cosmologically expanding region, and it's uh, ongoing work of Schlu uh, to uh, show the stability of that region. Uh, so let me finish with what's left to be done very, very quickly. Uh, open problem one, well, prove the stability of the Kerr exterior. Uh, once this is proven, then indeed, very strong cosmic censorship will be falsified as a corollary. And open problem two, as I said, I'm only showing the stability aspect. I'm only showing that the Cauchy horizon is still there. Uh, so open problem two is to show that for generic initial data, uh, the solution is inextendable if you require that the Christoffel symbols are locally uh, square integrable. And the motivation of this, so this you can think of as a weaker formulation of strong cosmic censorship, it's due to Christo Zulu. And the motivation, if you want, for this is that it tells you that, well, maybe you can extend as some sort of metric, but those metrics are not even weak solutions of the Einstein equations because sort of the derivatives of the metric are not square integral. So this would be at least some, um, some consolation. So a corollary of this would be that the Christo Zulu formulation of strong cosmic censorship is true in a neighborhood of the Kerr family. Now I warn you, to, to show that a version of strong cosmic censorship is false, of course, it suffices to show that it's false in the neighborhood of some solution because it's conjecture about generic initial data. To show that it's true, you really have to show it something about the whole modulary space of solutions. So a complete proof of this version of strong cosmic censorship appears to be something far away in the future. Okay, sorry to go over a little bit. Uh, thanks. see the paper hopefully <laughs> hopefully very soon I mean I tell my collaborators not to have babies but <laughs> they, they don't listen yes maybe another another question which is you're giving us uh, criteria on the, on the horizon and, and, and that criteria is sh shifting a little bit so you have a, I don't want to say philosophy but you have some sense of, of what physically would be a more desirable criterion? Here you have very strong, here you have weak singularities, but not L2. Now you talk about Christoffel symbols and their singularity, but their L2-ness. Um, we have, we've had a variety of singularities on horizons. And just tell us what you feel about. Well, I mean, what, what so it's not to get into philosophy, which I heard a lot about in Vienna last uh, weekend. But actually, your, your question is, in fact, um, so uh, I, I, I didn't mention, but there's another interesting thing about the case where you have a uh, positive cosmological constant, which is that is now you have many parameters in the solution. You have the cosmological constant, the 
the rotation parameter and the mass. And it turns out that heuristically, as you sort of move towards extremality in, this, in these parameters and you sort of do some heuristics, then this suggests that actually the singularity that you would expect on the Cauchy horizon gets weaker and weaker. So uh, in particular, you, you expect that the closer you are to extremality, then the higher sort of LP norm, you, you, LP regularity you have for the Christoffelsons. So in particular, uh, if you are sufficiently close, then they will be in L2. And, and that's really troubling, because that tells you that the um, Christodoulou formulation of strong cosmic censorship is probably not true uh, if, if you have cosmological constant. So that could even be an argument that there should not be a cosmological constant. People want a philosophical argument uh, for sort of why cosmological constant is bad. That, that could even be used as such. But in any case, that's, uh, that's to say that there, there <laughs> you know, th unfortunately the answer, the final answer is not as clean as we would have liked it to be. <coughs> And uh, you know, as a result, uh, sort of it does open the door to all sorts of speculation. What, what is the interpretation of this singularity? Should we, you know, is it the end of space-time or is it not? And the, uh, sort of, it's not as definitive as it would have been had very strong cosmic censorship been true. I guess some would allow a continuation, and others would not allow a continuation. Yeah, the, so the question is sort of what, yeah, what types of continuation are physically admissible, and we, we just don't know. Okay, I was yeah. one more question. Uh, so, so basically, expected the data that's allowable on the horizon is everything of the form chi hat smaller than Vigno minus P? Does yeah. And like your hope that that would be all, all data, just a simple inequality like that would. Uh, well, that's the thing. I mean, we, we start we start with this assumption and we solve the. But I was thinking of that's coming from uh, from uh, asymptotically flat data. It doesn't. Nothing now. I mean, it's sort of whether this came from an asymptotically flat region is not relevant anymore. No, I understand for your theorem, but I was wondering. So basically, you expect that just the, the, the data that's consistent with the asymptotically flat condition is just chi hats more than the minus p. Yeah. But well, I mean, there are more info. I mean, there's also I'm I'm suppressing the fact that you're also, in some sense, this should be a curse fear. I mean, this is a limiting sphere. That's to say that your 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 solution is approaching curve. Okay, uh, but you can think that this is sort of what parameterizes the free data on the horizon. Okay, and what you really need is that the free data is decaying sufficiently fast, and it's not you don't need no, what's what thought to be short. All data, all data that is decays sufficiently fast is coming from something that's uh, that's an asymptotic. Well, you have to add more data. You can try to add data here. Of course, uh, as we all know, sort of solving the scattering problem uh, has its own difficulties. So, yeah, one data that's so slow. Anyway, so, yeah. Yeah. I apologize, but I, you know, I'm under pressure. Can you say So we, we, we can have discussions. Uh, in, okay. <laughs> uh, thanks again, uh, Thanks.